perspectives on yoga as psychotherapy <clears throat> first thing you know that i would like to ask all of you is do you know of any you know uh, instance or any description in any ancient text where there has been a psychotherapy in the yoga texts hmm? what do we mean by psychotherapy psychotherapy means that an individual comes with a psychological conflict and through dialogue through dialogue the conflict is resolved and the individual is able to come out of that conflict you know so my question is are you aware of any such situation happening in the traditional yoga texts anybody yes <clears throat> Yes, I am seeing in the chat box, Shalini ji has written Krishna to Arjuna, Vashistha to Rama. Some people are writing uh, about Ashtavakra Gita. Very interesting, very interesting. Mandukya Upanishad, no, they, it is not a dialogue between two people. Ashtavakra Gita. Anybody else here, audience, anybody, any other instance you remember? Markandeya Purana. Okay, what is going on in that? Who is talking to whom? Rama is talking to Trimurti. Katho Upanishad. Dr. Sujata has put Katho Upanishad, where there is a dialogue between Yama and a boy, Nachiketa. Hmm? We also see uh, in Taitariya Upanishad, Bhrigu, huh? the son and Varuna, the father. They also have a dialogue where Bhrigu undergoes a kind of a Identity crisis. Wonderful, wonderful response, all of you. So, that is what hmm? I had also put. First and foremost example of a psychotherapy and I call Krishna as the first psychotherapist. Hmm? Where a conflict, an acute conflict has been resolved through dialogue that takes place in Bhagavad Gita. Then we as all of you correctly said, <clears throat> we see similar phenomena happening in the text Yoga Vashistha, where Rama was really depressed and depressed Rama was actually counseled by Vashistha to come out of his depression and then Rama decides to become the king again. Hmm? Means to take his responsibilities. We also see similar thing happening here, you know, where there is a dialogue between Bhrigu and Varuna happening in Taitariya Upanishad. Similarly, Tattvam Asi Shweta Ketu, hmm? that kind of a dialogue comes in Chandogya Upanishad, where <clears throat> through dialogue, the Guru Uddalaka resolves conflicts and questions of the Shishya Shweta, Shweta Ketu. Then as uh, you know, uh, somebody put in the chat box, what is this image about? What is this image about? Ashtavakra Gita. Hmm? Yes. Ashtavakra Gita where King Janaka is having a uh, question regarding sufferings in the life and Ashtavakra through the whole dialogue of Ashtavakra Gita, uh, one of the greatest of Jnana Yoga text, Ashtavakra Gita. Hmm? No Jnana Yogi, a person who is interested in the path of Jnana Yoga can afford to miss Ashtavakra Gita. So here also we see <clears throat> this kind of dialogue that comes up. So like that, there are several instances where we see that this has happened. Can anybody tell me what is shown in the slide here? Who are these two people? Gautama the Buddha, along with him, who is there? Hmm? Ananda, hmm? Dr. Sujata, wonderful. Hmm? Ananda is a friend and a disciple, always like a shadow with Buddha. Ananda actually 
ask a promise from Buddha that you will make me self-realized. At that cost only, I will join you. Hmm? And that promise itself became a hindrance for him. So, <clears throat> Ananda with Buddha Buddha also, you know, in all these texts, in all these dialogues, you know, they are psychotherapeutic, but there is a difference between Western psychotherapy and the way psychotherapy is approached in these scenarios. Hmm? What are the differences? Can anybody tell me? People can unmute and share. What do you think is the difference in the approach here and in the Western psychotherapy? Yes, Dr. Vaibhav. Um, uh, what I figure, what I sense is that uh, in Eastern philosophy, uh, in uh, the, the difference mainly is about, is uh, like uh, there is a dissolution of ego. Dissolution of ego is the, is, is the main uh, uh solution that is uh, is considered as the main solution in eastern philosophy uh with the dissolution of ego there there is a uh, there is a dissolution of uh, sufferings that is the main uh, uh, criteria for uh, in uh, eastern philosophies whereas in uh, uh, in modern uh, psych psychotherapy we have uh, um we have several uh, Th therapeutic procedures where in wherein uh, the, the, it does not go to the depth of dissolution of ego uh, maybe it it it, it uh, um it is like it is uh, se self introspections are considered but they do not go to the depth of dissolution dissolution of ego that is the difference that i sense very very beautifully answered uh, dr vaibhav Kindly introduce yourself uh, to the people here. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dr. Vaibhav. Uh, I've been practicing allopathy since six years now. And uh, I've completed MBBS from Bangal Court in North Karnataka. Thank and I'm working as a medical officer in government. Wonderful. Wonderful answer. It shows that you have a very deep insight into these texts. So the self has been the focus always in the Eastern philosophy. Whereas in the Western, there are even ego strengthening practices, hmm? even Western psychotherapy. I think some, some other people raised their hand and they wanted to share. Baidagi ji or uh, Ashwini ji, you can share. Uh, this is, sorry, uh, this is Chetan. Yes, Chetan. Uh, I, I believe that, um, the concept of Janma, Punarjanma, Prarabdha or Karma Siddhanta is more uh, understood by even the rural or the less literate or ignorant mm -hmm. people of India, whereas it's a very difficult concept for Westerners. Uh, with this concept, it's rather easy to do the psychotherapy or explain the situation or uh, come up with some solutions to our uh, rural or uh, uneducated or so-called uh, illiterate uh, Indian diaspora. That's what I think the main difference between the East and the West. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, Dr. Chetan. So he, you know, brings in that in the Eastern philosophy everywhere, there is a concept of karma, there is a con concept of punarjanma, you know, and that plays a role in these things. Very important point. Shalini ji, you were saying any other point you want to add anything else, anybody? Difference between Eastern and Western psychotherapy models we are discussing. Yeah. Uh, Shalini here. Yes. So what I wanted to say is uh, in Western philosophy, there is reductionism where we only consider the symptoms and signs of the mind. Hmm. But whereas in Eastern philosophy, we're going to take everything into consideration, the physical aspect, uh, through the Pancha Kosha, Ananda, uh, Annamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha, Vignanamaya Kosha, everything together. And uh, we have the uh, knowledge that all of them are linked. And so we are able to reach 
I mean, Anandamaya Kosha is the is where you have resolution of all your uh, mental problems, uh, cognition and emotions and all that. So with all this in-depth knowledge of our shastras, we are able to reach the highest. Of course, um, our uh, real self and the true self is um, beyond all the koshas, panchakosha, athita, but at least we are able to understand all these concepts and uh, teach uh, patients so they could learn step by step. Of course, it takes commitment, uh, but this is like one and all cure. Yes, yes. So this is another viewpoint, you know, that this goes in a more holistic way, whereas in the Western psychotherapy module, module, you see that there is a particular symptom that is bothering a person and I do a CBT to resolve that symptom. So it is more like, you know, modern medicine approach where the absence of illness is focused. Whereas in the Eastern psychotherapy, it is the presence of health and well-being. It has a positive psychology component into it. Yes, yes. But now, you know, recently positive psychology is also coming up and there are many borrowed concepts that comes from Eastern psychotherapy there. I see that uh, Brinda, Brinda has written, modern psychotherapy addresses the problem of the mind that has temporarily arisen. Eastern psychotherapy addresses the problem in its entirety, like questioning the existence, understanding the world. Correct. Vaishnavi, you wanted to share anything else? Okay. Uh, several points have come up. Uh, I would like to ask, is there any other difference? Anybody can, think, the way the therapy is delivered, the way the setting is, the client, the, the teacher, is, the, is there any other point that you can say that there is a difference? Western and East. Well, actually, I joined very late. I am asking a question regarding the difference between Eastern psychotherapy models and the Western psychotherapy models. Uh, Dr. Ritu has written, Western psychotherapy module, there is no approach towards internal bliss and indriyas or senses as a cause of various afflictions of the mind. While Eastern psychotherapy adds an Atman, Indriya, Chitta, Vritti, as we see in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra also. Beautiful, very beautiful. Hmm? So, <clears throat> the, the aspect that beyond Panchakosha is the Purusha and that Purusha is where all the conflicts are resolved if you are able to touch that state of existence. So, the whole approach is to turn inwards and touch that metacognitive aspect of uh, one's existence is there in Eastern psychotherapy. Whereas in Western psychotherapy, the management is Within the mind, within the intellect, I try to manage. I don't transcend. That transcendental approach is something that is different. Dr. Sujata has written, individualized protocol including diet, lifestyle. Yeah, that point has already been brought by Shalini ji. Aditi, Aditi, please share your views. Sir, uh, I think in Eastern uh, uh, psychotherapy, there is some authoritativeness to the guru. Or, or the one who is telling something has some authority and uh, says that I know. Whereas uh, we see in the Western psychotherapy, there is always uh, th th the passiveness from the therapist side and they say that, that they're just the mediators and they don't direct something, they don't teach something, they don't, they don't preach something. Very important point. Huh? <laughs> the directive approaches are seen in the Eastern psychotherapy. You see in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna initially describes all his worries and tensions. Hmm? In fact, First chapter, there are around 50 shlokas and another 40 shlokas of the second chapter, almost 90 shlokas hmm, are there where Krishna is talking and Arjuna uh, Arjuna is talking, his, his symptoms, his worries, all that. And like a very expert psychotherapist, hmm, Krishna is just sitting and listening. Hmm? So for 90 shlokas, Krishna doesn't say anything, he just listens. And after complete catharsis, after telling everything what Arjuna wanted, then Arjuna only tells him, I am confused between dharma and adharma. Shishyate aham, I am your shishya. Please guide me. Then Krishna opens his mouth. Hmm? So first lesson of psychotherapy from the Eastern psychotherapy point of view, 
that we see from Bhagavad Gita is that we should not interrupt when the person who is sitting in front of you is talking. We should be attentive and patient listeners. That is very, very important in psychotherapy. And once the person completes speaking, whatever he wants when he has spoken out, then when you are attentively, patiently listening to him, then you will see that person will reach a point where he will stop and look forward to now what you have to say. So it means now the person is prepared to receive. It is only then that your therapy should be delivered. Hmm? Otherwise, the person has not yet finished talking and you start delivering your therapy, it will not go deep into him and the session will not progress smoothly. So, <clears throat> very important here is that in all these scenarios, all the disciples are actually bowing down to their gurus. Hmm? So, this also shows the uh, the psyche of the population in this part of the world, where actually, you know, as uh, Chetanji was saying that the population here, be, here wants advices. You know, they uh, uh, cannot, you know, uh, decide for themselves, even if you make them more aware. Therefore, this, uh, in always in India, we see that this culture where one or the other guru emerges and mass follows them is is very strong we don't see such people emerging in the west you know but in the east in india you see one or the other person comes up because <clears throat> probably the attitude of having faith shraddha is inbuilt in the genetics of this kind of a population hmm? uh, so uh, the directive approaches has been working for centuries you know but one thing that i would like to point out uh, even in Bhagavad Gita, you know, the, the, uh, the, the kind of a attitude that Krishna adopts is when, uh, uh, when Arjuna says that I am your Shishya and you have to guide me, then actually Krishna <clears throat> gives him all the options of different paths of yoga, starting from Jnana Yoga in the second chapter, coming to Karma Yoga in the third, fourth, fifth, then coming to Raj Yoga or Dhyan Yoga in the sixth part of 7th and from the 7th onwards he takes him into Bhakti Yoga. In fact, at the end of 6th chapter, you see that he has a dialogue with him and he says that uh, Arjuna, I have given you this approach of uh, doing Abhyasa but if it is difficult for you then you simply give up the uh, fruits behind the action. If that is also very difficult for you then you do one thing, you just surrender everything to me. You know, like that he gives him choices. And after all the choices are finished, when he keeps asking questions and he keeps answering at the end of 18th chapter, Krishna tells him <clears throat> that Yathechasi tatha kuru. This is what I wanted to tell you. I have told everything. I don't want to tell you whether you should fight or you should not fight. He doesn't give him a decision. What he tells him? Yathechasi tatha kuru. Whatever now you feel like doing, you do. So ultimately, he also gives a open choice. So by directive approaches, we do not mean that the guru is actually telling him, do this. Guru takes an authoritative role and in that authority, he describes or tells whatever wisdom that he has. And then at the end, again, gives the choice in the hand of Shishya to make a decision. But yes, Guru takes a higher pedestal and uh, uh, the Shishya has a reverence, a gratitude towards the Guru. And in that scenario, this kind of a dialogue takes place in Eastern psychotherapy. Most of this happens like that. Um, so this is one difference. <clears throat> also, we see another difference that many of these scenarios, you see that there are a lot of parables that are used. In Bhagavad Gita also, a lot of parables from real life situations they are taken like the parable of the chariot comes in uh, uh, Katha Upanishad. Similarly, you know, Krishna describes the parable of how the uh, ignorance uh, covers uh, the mind or the chitta of the individual. He gives three examples for that. He says that this adnyana is covering the Atman like the smoke covers the fire. Second, he says like the dust covers the mirror. And third, he says like the uh, meconium or the sheath covers a newborn baby. You know, the 
तो ही गिव्स दिस थ्री एग्जाम्पल्स एंड दिस थ्री एग्जाम्पल्स एक्चुअली मीन दैट देर आर थ्री काइंड ऑफ सिचुएशन वेर दी इग्नोरेंस कवर्स द नॉलेज इन ए सात्विक पर्सन the ignorance covers the fire of knowledge just like a smoke you put little air give them little understanding suddenly they wake up and they understand what is to be done what is not to be done so here the remembrance of gnana is required in a very mild way whereas a rajasik person needs little more effort if there is a dust on the mirror you have to take a cloth and wipe it or put water onto it no so in that way it requires a little more deeper understanding deeper discussion to remove the ignorance of a rajasik personality whereas a tamasik person hmm, a very thick covering that is there uh, on the skin of the baby when the baby is born when you want to remove it with water also it doesn't remove you have to actually rub it hard uh, and use warm water and clean it again and again and then it gets cleansed so like that for a tamasic person you need more effort rubbing it again and again over the person for a longer duration we have such kind of personalities around us no we see certain typical personalities no matter how many times you make them understand certain thing again they do the same mistake so you have to keep pushing keep pampering keep telling them again and again you know they your what they have to do and slowly it comes into them whereas other people a just a subtle look changes their behavior hmm or just one clear dialogue it changes so in psychotherapy also yoga or the eastern approaches understand the mind of a person whether i am dealing with a satvik client or a rajasik client or a tamasik client and then we understand how many sessions it is going to take for me to remove the covering of the darkness this darkness or avidya is their emotional conflicts they are their delusions they are their you know uh, what you can say uh, thinking patterns which are causing them trouble and they need to be addressed so in this way the parables are used more often stories are used many often you know stories are used and then uh, after telling the story uh, the teacher asks the student so what do you understand by these stories the panchatantra stories are all like that you know where every story ultimately had a hidden meaning behind it which gave an insight to the client hmm? we see similar kind of stories uh, uh, being described in the vedas in uh, between the danavas and the devas there was a fight they go to brahma and then brahma utters the word da da and da as the solution so the danavas rakshasas understand by the word da means they have to do more dana that will purify them whereas the devas understand it saying dama it means they should control their sense organs hmm? so in this way whatever meaning is told that is also interpreted differently by a satvik person rajasik person and a tamasik person so this dynamic play of the gunas the psychotherapist is very much aware of it you know and uh, he tries to channelize the session using the these yes dr deepa has written there are mentors who act like guru giving advices but in another way in life style choices in the western side yes another thing we see in western psychotherapy you know that the, there is um, uh, homework that is given where people are asked to do certain tasks which are mainly uh, more reflective in nature where they have to think upon and do certain things in eastern psychotherapy also certain tasks are given but these tasks are more not like writing and other thing they are more like related to doing something so one example that i can give related to that is uh, the story that happens with gautama the buddha you know a lady who lost her uh, son she is mourning as she is very very depressed and no amount of you know counseling is uh, bringing her any kind of solace she wants to commit suicide she wants to die and that person goes to buddha and says that uh, i want to die you know and uh, you have i have come to you as a last resort just for a confirmation that what i am doing is right because there is no other interest that i have in my life if my baby is not there or if you can bring my baby back i will live people have such expectation also from their gurus 
uh, in Eastern uh, models, uh, they go to Guru, they think you know, something magical can happen. So those faith are there. So Buddha tells her, her that, okay, you can take the decision that you that you want. Hmm, Gautami. Uh, it is Gautami story. You can do what you want. But before that, I want you to do a simple exercise and then we will do it. So go to the whole village and then collect one grain of rice you know uh, from each house if you uh, and you have to collect the grain from the house where nobody has died or nobody has suffered because of anybody's death so she thinks it is a easy task she goes and then as she goes from one house to another one house to another and asks people about who has died what has happened people start telling pay their painful stories one after another, how much they miss their loved one, you know. And she also reaches some kind of a scenarios where people are there who are suffering much more than her. Hmm? And then finally she comes empty-handed back to Buddha and says that, yes, I have understood. Hmm? So this is, a, death is a phenomena which is unavoidable and everybody is going through it. And so this is a behavioral technique that Buddha told her to do and with that she came out of it you know so there are these kind of scenarios also that has taken place in ancient texts now we need to give all this a structure you know uh, with this structure only we will be able to do psychotherapy uh, so one of the structure that we have been exploring at Nimhans in dealing with this is trying to understand the gunas of the person and then also trying to understand how the conflict in the Manomaya Kosha can be resolved by directing this person towards the consciousness or Atman or his true self within. And for him to direct within, we take different approaches. But the fundamental model is that the conflict will be resolved when the individual goes closer to his real self. Tadadrashtuhu swarupe avasthanam. This is the definition of health according to yoga. When I am established in my observer self, in that metacognitive awareness where I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am the observer. In that self, we want them to get established. This is something that has been borrowed by modern psychotherapy and they call it as a third wave of psychotherapy as mindfulness-based therapies. This is a completely Eastern concept. Hmm? Where rather than changing the pattern of thinking, I look at the whole process of thinking as an observer with a non-judgmental attitude. Okay? So, to establish oneself into that observer, depending on the guna of the person, whether he is a sattvic, rajasic or tamasic, you can use different paths. Hmm? So the question that comes into our mind is how to decide which approach should to take for this person to enter into that transcendental zone. If you want to take somebody into transcendental state, which approach to take? Say for example, if I am uh, really stressed, I am traveling in Bangalore traffic. Yeah, I am sure many of you may not know, but Bangalore traffic is horrible, especially in the rainy season. So if I am, you know, traveling and I have to reach somewhere fast and I am stuck in my car. You know? Now I am stuck in such a way that I cannot take my car back or front. It is already being 45 minutes and there is no use of honking also and you are feeling really distressed. Hmm? In such a scenario, how to reduce the distress of such a person? Hmm? Imagine that I, I come out of my car and just besides the car on the roadside, there is a warm air balloon. Hmm? Air balloon, where I sit into that balloon. Hmm? And that balloon slowly starts taking me up. Hmm? And I go up around a kilometer. Now I look down. Hmm? Tiny, tiny cars. Then I also look on the roadside. I look at the sky. I look at the trees around, everywhere. And suddenly I am much more comfortable and enjoying the whole situation. Correct? Why? What has happened? In the car, I was confined. My consciousness was limited. 
only up to the car and that scenario. Now, when I developed a broader perspective of looking myself in a vast, see, ultimately, I am vertically up. I have not moved forward or backward. My problem has not solved. Problem is still there. But I have created a distance between me and my problem. When I am merged into the problem, I suffer. When there is a space between me and my problem, the more it is, the more is my resilience. Hmm? So this metacognitive awareness is something that all the Eastern approaches try to bring. I am Atma Brahma, Tat Tvam Asi, Aham Brahma Asmi. Hmm? So in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Nainam Chindanti Shastrani, Nainam Dahati Pavakaha, Nachainam Kleda Yantyapaha, Nashosha Yati Maruti. Hmm? A Chintyoyam, A Shoshoyam, A Chedyo, A Kledyacha. Hmm? Nitya Sarvagata Stanuhu, Achalo Yam Sanatana. Nitya always there. Hmm? Sarvagataha everywhere. Sthanuhu achalam stable unmoving. Sanatan ancient and the most ancient. That is you. Hmm? I am not the body. I am not the mind. So that kind of a awareness is brought in. But this awareness, to bring that awareness, there are different paths. So the whole approach of psychotherapy is how do I get in this person into that path? So every person has a unique path. You know? And that depends on his guna configuration. Hmm? So this is the approach or the model that we have been working on. So the question that we want to ask, I want to ask all of you, is from your childhood, you know, what are the ways in which you have been coping in a stressful situation. For example, remember that you were in your early teenage, uh, your 7th, 8th, ninth standard, when you were stressed due to exam or something happened in school and you were very worried and you came back. Hmm? A bad day in school. Hmm? You came back crying in your school van. And then what happened? What did you do when you came back? Or in your early teenage or adolescent? What kind of person are you? First thing that you have to think in your mind is whether you are a kind of a person who went out to discuss your problem with somebody and wanted to express it or you were a person who went in. So as a coping strategy, first find out whether you went outward or you went inward. Okay. Person who goes inward, what he does is he doesn't talk to anybody. Family, whole family is worried. Suddenly he goes and shuts himself inside. Okay, what happened? What happened? Some, somebody asked him. He won't talk to anybody. Huh? So this is one person. Second type of person is as soon as he is stressed, he is bothered. First thing that will come to his mind is his loved one. Hmm? She will remember her boyfriend or her mom and immediately she wants to talk and catharsis. Pura detail mein till she tells, she will not feel comfortable. Hmm? Otherwise, there will be a gurgling in the stomach that will continue. Hmm? So, this is majorly, this is two types. Going in. Now, when you go out, in out, you can do two things. One, you express your emotion. Second, you go into some kind of activity. Hmm? So, you have to understand either going outward or inward. And then in the outward and inward also, there can be a cognitive approach and there can be a behavioral approach. So, outward, cognitive, outward, behavioral, inward, cognitive, inward, behavioral. Am I clear? Okay. So you now identify for yourselves. What did you do? If you adopted a cognitive approach, not talking to anybody, inward. First, categorize yourself as you went out or you went in. Hmm? Then within in, if you were more analyzing in nature, analyzing like, what did that person say? What did I say? 
what might be going on in that person's mind when he told that what i how i reacted last time when this happened how did i react because of that what consequences happened now how should i react or the way i reacted was it proper or not so complete analysis no huh? this kind of people usually alone go for a walk or they go on to a terrace alone think through this mechanism they try to cope okay yes second hmm? second mechanism is cognitive only but this is more inward inward in the sense they will not talk to anybody uh, but they will be not cognitive it is inward only but more behavioral they will isolate themselves and then what they will do they will listen to music hmm or they will uh, uh, start writing whatever that they are going through or they will uh, uh, get into some kind of a uh, diverting activity which may be their hobby or they may simply just lie down in the bed doing nothing not even thinking sleeping hmm? so such kind of people where the approach is more related to inward only but related not more with thinking but some activity hmm? this is second category we can call it as p type practice type so initial two are inward a is analytical personality that is type a all of you note down you have to diagnose your personality hmm? a type second is p type who is inward but more activity or behavioral oriented practice oriented they may also you know chant some mantra or they may also do some pranayama or do some asanas themselves that is their way second category then the third category are outward third and fourth are outward in the outward e type e type are those who find relief by using a cognitive approach cognitive means mentally they are trying to connect with another person and trying to express all their emotions so emotions are more mental activity so they are e type and the fourth category we can call them as uh, uh, b type or busy type where they are outward they are stressed and what they do is they become more busy with their profession or the work they have to do you know so there are people you know their private life is completely a mess but they keep their professional life very perfect hmm? so these are the people who divert or reduce their stress by uh, engaging more and more into activity and the more achievement they get in their profession that gives them satisfaction they are b type such people in stressful situation actually end up doing better in their performance become more productive hmm? so there are four personalities a type p type e type and b type you understand now you have to diagnose yourself whether you are a a dominant p dominant e dominant or b dominant okay so i request all of you actually to put in the chat box to put in the chat box even if it is a combo write it in the order most dominant first then the second then the third and so on okay so write like that a plus b or you know uh, b plus a something like that so i see uh, deepthi has written a b type shalini also a and b somya e type gunjita p plus a namita p plus a uh we see chandrakan p type a plus e is vrinda yuhi is a plus p amin amin is a plus p a plus e asifa p plus b plus a suraksha pratib a plus e srishti p plus e why is practice inward because it is done for a cognitive kind of a satisfaction and the person whatever things that are doing that he is doing 
these practices also have a more internalizing kind of a nature like listening to music or performing some he doesn't do it to satisfy anybody else outside in the world whereas work that is done is to get reward from outside so so the question here is why the practice is inside and the busy work is outside practice is inward because the ultimate satisfaction that the individual gets is within himself with the practice directly whereas in the busy type they do work then people appreciate then they feel satisfaction you understand so p type p plus e type and therefore it is mostly related to their profession wonderful i am so happy you know all of you are responding here tell me are quickly what are your type appa e plus p no e plus p combination is little rare yeah p a plus e p plus e yours was hmm e plus a e a all all four yeah uh, in that order so e a yeah a e p e a p so you are also combining the outward and inward approaches some people are combining outward inward approaches also yes yes madam a ha uh, a and b mainly keeping busy and analytic ha uh, p and b hmm e plus a or p e e is dominant and then e plus a or p yes manoj a b yes madam p ap huh so if you you know try to understand there are almost uh, you know around 90 people here who have responded here so a sample of 100 if it is taken we see that there is a pattern where many combinations are coming up you know if you i overall look a looks quite common hmm? a everybody is putting a somewhere and after a i think i see the uh, e is also a common approach and then comes the approaches p p also quite common and then b okay now why is it important to know hmm initially inward and after a few days outward expression later yes why is it important to know because you want to find out what is the path or what is the approach that you have to take for this patient for him to get into the metacognitive awareness or transcendental awareness correct now the way i cope with a stress as my genetic tendency from my childhood as a natural tendency is something that is programmed in my gene and if you look at it from the eastern philosophy point of view i would say that this is something that you have been doing again and again in your many past lives also so when a person is under stress the coping that comes naturally from within not a learn not a learned acquired skill see people may later on acquire many thing it may also differ from instances like i may cope differently when my family members are involved in my stress whereas i may cope differently when my professionals are involved in my stress but there are learned aspects but i am talking about the way of coping which is naturally there in you when you were you were born you know it is somewhere in your genes and it is something that you have done many a times in your lives in the past also so with that knowledge what happens is you can just fine tune that approach by refining it with yogic knowledge you know then you can grow in that path faster rather than taking a entirely different path from your nature okay so the application here is that a person who is asking analytical kind of a question you know can further fine tune rather than rather than questioning why me he can question who is suffering rather than questioning why i am suffering he can question who is suffering seeing actually the whole process of thinking in the same way the second category of the people who are practice oriented they can refine their practices by using yoga pranayama meditative japa and those kind of a practices whereas people who were very busy in their action those kind of people 
can adopt the philosophy of karma yoga you know and uh, uplifting the society without asking anything in return and then comes the path of bhakti yoga where the emotional aspect are channelized towards a higher source or a uh, dt which is unmoving which is more stable because if you express it to people who are changing then it creates distress so therefore you know the people who are a type are suited for the path of nyan yoga people who are we can say b type or busy type suited for karma yoga people who are more e type they are suited for the path of bhakti yoga and people who were more p type practice type they are suited for the path of raj yoga where you use your will power your power of determination and overcome all the difficulties in life these aspects have also been brought by patanjali also in the form of kriya yoga kriya yoga is swadhyaya ishwar tapah swadhyaya and ishwar pranidhana tapa is for practice swadhyaya is for jnana and ishwar pranidhana is for bhakti these domains and these are actually niyamas also niyamas are five shauch santosh tapas swadhyaya ishwar pranidhan in that three niyamas have been taken as kriya yoga hmm? because the three dominant personalities whether you are will power dominant intellect dominant or emotion dominant he has taken action dominance actually can come from shaucha and santosha the other two niyamas which are there so dear friends this is the flow chart hmm? to identify the particular approach of psychotherapy for a person depending on his personality so first you identify his coping style see denial of a stressor or using any practice of a stressor stressor go together because they are both done by will power and then emotional expression keeping busy so the person categorized into four personality type intellect dominant will power dominant emotion dominant action dominant then four paths of yoga are chosen and then the particular philosophical approaches more detailed you know then you can call this person and start discussing second chapter of bhagavad gita with him i give you a homework you read these five shlokas of bhagavad gita think about it and come back let us discuss in our psychotherapy session tomorrow so which shlokas i have to choose for the person to think hmm? i may actually have to give him a print out of selected shlokas related to jnana yoga ha huh? okay these are the shlokas that have come from bhagavad gita please read contemplate on them or we can simply say that you can go come next week by uh, reading and thinking about these five shlokas you tell me your meaning of the shloka and then i will try to tell my meaning to you and we will try to come to a understand in this a person who is more analytical will be able to move from why me to who is suffering who am i that in the same way we can use the dhyan yoga the sixth chapter of bhagavad gita or eight limbs of yoga given by patanjali in a step by step psychotherapy session for a raj yogi we can also use emotion dominant aspect that starts from the ninth chapter of bhagavad gita till 12th and third fourth and fifth chapter of bhagavad gita about the karma yoga so giving shloka to the people asking them to think about it again come back for the session then discuss again with them this is what we have been trying to do here at nimhans so these are typical examples of people who have actually perfected that particular path of yoga using that particular stream of yoga hmm? so raman maharshi he symbolizes his whole philosophy is about who am i who is suffering hmm? i am not the body i am not the mind then who is suffering hmm? i am the observer uninvolved so that deeper and deeper questioning questioning is the path of jnan yoga you should be able to ask very deep very fundamental question the question is not to prove your knowledge the question is really there is a thirst 
deep thirst for knowledge for that question is asked hmm? so bhagavad gita says tad vidhi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya updekshanti te jnanam jnaninah tatva darshina hmm? so you have to go with humbleness bow down do seva to a person who has tatva jnana and then pari prashna in jnana yog the disciple has to ask a question guru will not answer without asking pari prashnena sevaya then with compassion the guru wants in fact there is a upanishad known as prashna upanishad where there are five six disciples who go to guru pippalada and guru asks them to do their seva for one whole year and after that gives them the authority to ask question then he answers hmm, this is how the path of jnana yoga functions then second is swami vivekananda a meditator meditator say come what may i will not deter hmm? uddhare atmana atmanam na atmanam avasadayet atmaye vahyat mano banduhu atmaye varipur atmana man should help himself because he himself is his greatest friend he himself is his greatest enemy no with this kind of a philosophy krishna describes the path of raj yoga to arjuna hmm? so here the whole effort is on continuous abhyasa continuous practice even if you know body says you cannot do it mind says you cannot do it the person just does it and along with it there is a sacrifice there is vairagya there is uh, you know determination that i will not stop till the goal is reached this is uttishtata uh, jagrata hmm varan nibodat get up hmm awake and stop not till you reach the goal till you gain that knowledge from the no people where does this come hmm anybody swami vivekananda swami vivekananda swami vivekananda quoted from some upanishad acho uttishtata jagr jagrata varan nibodat hmm correct katho upanishad hmm katho upanishad so this is the approach of a raj yogi hmm? very systematic perfectionist and will stop not till the goal is reached he can die but he will not give up in the fight against his own mind hmm? so this is the second approach then we see mother teresa mirabai such approaches where this is exactly opposite of a raj yogi this bhakti yogi fellow says i have already lost all the battles i already accept my defeat ego is given up okay you are big i am nothing hmm? so the example they give is there is a baby of a monkey monkey's baby holds on to the mother and mother jumps from one tree to another so it is the effort of the baby to hold the mother if the baby loses the grip baby falls hmm? this is what jnana yogi or raj yogi is do they hold to the truth with their own effort whereas what does a bhakti yogi do he is like a kitten cats kitten in the corner completely helpless they just keep crying meow 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 nothing else whatever happens to them only thing they do is their japa they just taking god's name and crying for god then what happens after some time mother cat comes holds the baby in her jaws and takes to a safe place wherever she wants and baby doesn't do anything it is the responsibility of the mother to carry the baby huh this is the path of bhakti yoga i already lost what will you do i am lost from all the direction i am nothing so only thing i do is focus on the sand particles of the feet of my god and take his name and everything else i give to him i never had any strength i will never have any strength i am a papi they look at themselves as very low creatures hmm? say that there is no greater deen than me hmm? there is lot of deenata in bhakti bhava say everybody is above me i am below everybody 
and on the feet of God only I worship and do. Hmm? Though it appears easy, it is the most difficult part. It requires a lot of purification of the chitta. And then in the path of karma yoga, in the path of karma yoga, there is action. But the action is not done for the sake of the reward of the action. The action is done for a greater cause, higher purpose. Mostly in karma yoga, it is about uplifting the society, helping the mankind, making this world a better place to live. Hmm? And in that selflessly, person keeps working irrespective of whether he is winning or losing. So, yogastha kuru karmani sangam tyaktva dhananjaya siddhi asiddhi samo bhutva samatvam yoga ucchate. Mahatma Gandhi was such a person. Hmm? After stopping his asahyoga andolan, hmm? When he called it off, people were very upset. When he came out of his railway station, uh, people gave him black roses. You stopped us and yoga andolan. He took those black roses also with the same zeal as he would take a pink rose. Walking. Doesn't matter. Siddhi, asiddhi, samo bhutva. Hmm? These are karma yogis. Not wasting even a single second or a resource that can contribute for the upliftment of the society, of the mankind, service of the mankind. Completely giving up life for the social cause. These are, this is the way they purify their chitta. And by doing such karma, these people slowly, slowly start getting into that metacognitive awareness. By doing karma like this, their chitta purifies and reflects the Atman. Whereas in Bhakti, Ananyas chinta yanto maam ye janaha pariyu pasate tesham nitya bhi yukta naam yoga kshema vaham yaham. In LIC policy you see no? Yoga kshema vaham yaham it is written. What does it mean? Yoga means whatever a person doesn't have and needs. Kshema means whatever he has and needs protection. Krishna promises in 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. I will do this for you, Arjuna, your yoga and kshema, I myself will take care. Means I will give you what you need. I will protect what you have. Provided you fulfill two conditions for me. What are they? Ananya Shintayam Toma. In your heart, there should not be more, should not be anybody more important than me. Ananya. Ananya means no one else. Krishna that way is very possessive with his bhaktas. Hmm? Ananyas chintayam. Hmm? Second, he says, Nitya Yukta. You will always try to remember me. Like an unbroken thread, you will never stop connecting to me. Whenever you remember, you connect and try to maintain the thread of this connection in a continuity. Two conditions. If you fulfill, Yoga Kshema Vaham. I will. Not that God is selfish, but for him to take control of your life, he needs surrender. Draupadi was very upset on Krishna. Hmm? Her Chirharana episode had happened. They were in uh, Vanavasa and uh, she was not talking to Krishna. So Krishna understood this and came there. Then uh, he went, he, when he came in front of her, she turned her face of the other side. Then Krishna asked her, what happened? Krishna also, her name was also Krishna only, Krishna. Hmm? So then she says, I will not talk to you. You called yourself as my Sakha. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Hmm? When I was in the greatest of my crisis, getting humiliated, those Kauravas were pulling my hair. I was almost half naked there. My sari was pulled. You insensitive fellow, you were watching. Hmm? Why should I talk to you? Is this friendship? Draupadi looks logical. What do you say? What anybody else has to say? Hmm. Hmm? So, so then, 
Krishna tells her, I was eagerly waiting. I was eagerly waiting. First, Duryodhan called his mama to throw the dice. Shakuni. Yudhishthir, before going to Hastinapur, didn't even inform me. Forget about asking me to join him for the play. Didn't tell me. Hmm? Number two, when you were getting humiliated, you first approached your five husbands. Then you saw all of them are looking down. Hmm? Then you look towards Bhishma Pitama. Then you look towards Dronacharya. Then you look Look towards other gurus, hmm? Purohits. Then you look towards Yudhish, uh, Dhritarashtra. When nobody could help you and they were pulling your sari, pulling your hair. After that, you started resisting with your own hands, both the hands, with your teeth. Hmm? Even when that was pulled by force, when nothing could be done, then with one hand you started calling me and with other hand still you were holding your sari. My problem is I have given so much freedom to the human being when I you know, got this being on the planet. I made this particular being in my own image and give him, given so much freedom that even if I wish I cannot enter into this person's life unless he completely wants me to enter. As soon as you left the other hand, I was there. I didn't take even a single second to manifest myself in my Vastra Avatar. That is called as Krishna's Vastra Avatar. The sari did not finish on me. Hmm? Kept on pulling it. it. It would never end. Never end. Hmm? So, with Bhakta, it is like this. In Bhakti, he says, I from the beginning only, I won't even touch it. I won't go to anybody else. Ananya. There is nobody else for me. No other shelter. Only one. And Nitya Yukta because in the moment when you forget, he doesn't have access to enter into you. So he wants to be in your life 24 by 7. That's why he wants you to be Nitya Yukta. You understand? Because he wants to protect you at all the times. So these are the different paths of yoga that we use in psychotherapy, understanding the different personalities of the individual. So this is what I wanted to share with all of you today. We have come towards the end of the session. And uh, uh, if there are any questions on what we have discussed, any doubt anybody has, we can clear that before ending this session. Dr. Bhargav, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, I'm born and raised in India and spent more than half of my life in the Western world. Uh, but uh, I feel that psychology or psychoanalysis or uh, uh, even uh, going to a psychologist for some sessions is still considered to be something like Paglonki Khani. Means uh, in India, they back home in India. Uh, they consider that to be something uh, stigma. Uh, stigma, yes. And uh, I left India 30 years back. I was wondering, how is the situation now? Are the people more open to uh, going to a psychologist and getting uh, the help or they still have the stigma? Yes. Uh, the situation is better in metropolitan cities, but in the rural area still, you know, the situation is similar. Uh, of course, you know, with technology, with, uh, you know, more and more information coming up, this is slowly becoming better. Uh, but yoga, you know, uh, Chetanji is something which uh, doesn't carry any stigma with it. And in fact, Nimhans as an institute itself carries a stigma. And we, even in Bangalore, people use it like, you know, I think I should take you to Nimhans. You know, if, person exactly. does, <laughs> if a person does things which he should not do. So that kind of things are still there. Uh, 
but uh, the way yoga has helped in this kind of a psychiatric practice here is that the department of integrative medicine is not only about removing the illness but promoting wellness as well so in this aspects patients who have such a stigma they can actually say that i go to nimans to do yoga i go to nimans to undergo panchakarma as my well being therapy and not essentially you know because i am mentally ill so so since we have now started sessions for literally you know the normal people people who are just stressed and such kind of population stigma here has been coming down and my advice is that those who are you know mental health experts who are psychologists you can also use yoga into your practice to remove stigma uh, from the practice because yoga is very well received and yoga is very respectable all film stars big big people are doing yoga so it is taken in a very positive way and we we tell people that we will in fact we have been you know admitting people in the name of yoga and then giving them psychiatric treatment also so yoga comes as a shield also and as a means to enhance compliance with these therapies also and uh, uh, psychoanalysis or psychotherapy is extremely expensive on the western world how is it back home in india is it affordable oh hmm, it is quite expensive in bangalore if you have to undergo one session of uh, psychotherapy they will charge you 2000 rupees hmm? so structured psychotherapy even in a online mode it goes to around 1000 rupees so therefore it is quite costly and in country like india sir the demand and the number of resource person who are available it will never match so trained cbt experts or psychotherapists they are way less than what is the demand and it is here that culturally sensitive interventions like yoga which are scalable you know the models that can really work we have been actually running a lay counselor program where thousands of people even school teachers are coming and undergoing this kind of a training where yoga is a inherent part of that lay counseling program you know so uh, this is something which i feel is a model that will work better in a country like india uh, the degree of counseling that we get in india uh, yes. is it uh, valid all over the world in the western world especially yes yes western world at least because the population is less we every person can manage to have a therapist but um, in india still you will see that you know the people will still go to their elders people will still go to temple temple priests and if those people are educated and taught about you know principles from modern psychotherapy point of view and how you know they can systematically you know use yoga also as a psychotherapy then probably we can be you know in a better position to address but it is a huge demand huge demand on the system right now to address mental health using psychotherapy last question sir uh, yes. the recent stampede that happened in hathras because of the bole bhabas uh, uh, congregation do you think that this would be a very appealing and easy way to do mass appeal and uh, enlighten uh, the uneducated the downtrodden the poor the backwards Uh, all the ahindas isn't it that a uh, better way to have somebody who has an authority and knowledge and uh, the integrity to do mass appeal correct i i completely agree with you so these are the side effects of these kind of phenomena you know when people are really devoted then if a person you know uh, can actually make use of that faith you know in a wrong way and here you know uh, the awareness has to go into masses only because people only have to Uh, have that wisdom to understand who uh, is the person whom they can listen to and follow and who they should not so this is something that will come with a internal wisdom and more awareness in public but if such a person comes up like there are wonderful people also who are doing great things you know like sadguru has done wonderful things in society connecting rivers in india so such people when they talk such thing then it actually brings lot of transformation and it is a good platform for mass appeal whereas people like bhole baba you know who ask people to collect sand from their feet and in that process the stampede happens then it is a problematic thing no so therefore we have to be very careful and uh, everything that we use uh, has to be scientific has to be applied into practice and then you know when i am talking here i have actually dealt with patient i have done therapy sessions with them therefore i am able to talk in front of you now you know so it should always be evidence based and we should take things positively forward 
थैंक यू डॉक्टर पार्गो सॉरी नमस्ते सर नमस्ते सर दिस इज डॉक्टर रश्मि सर आई वांटेड टू नो हैविंग लेस नॉलेज अबाउट द साइकोथेरेपीज व्हाट इज डन एग्जैक्टली इन सीबीटी डीबीटी दिस different types of psychotherapies what is done exactly yeah so basically they work towards restructuring your thinking process huh? restructuring the thought in cbt what you see is that there is a particular pattern of thinking that has been set up and in that pattern in the center there is a schema there is a particular uh, wrong notion that the person has which generates that kind of a thinking pattern and in cbt the person is made aware of it usually you are uh, you know they will if you have a certain kind of a uh, notion they will ask you to find out the points which are in favor of it which are in opposite of it and in that dialogue they will try to understand the central schema <coughs> where the cognitive distortion is happening and they make the person aware of it and try to connect it they also use behavioral techniques to do that giving them certain homeworks asking them to do certain things so i believe i believe that if i go uh, outside i will catch an infection you know now so in cbt i will gradually be desensitized i will be able to question that notion of me whether it is it is true test it in the real life you know in a control atmosphere so like that in cbt you work on the thought whereas in dbt it is more uh, related to what you can say the uh, aspects of not going to the extremes of anything and coming towards the middle you know so uh, in uh, people like borderline personality disorders and all they undergo a long term dbt therapy because they have a tendency of jumping into conclusions and they have a tendency of going into too much of attachment and too much of aversion so they are taught this process of not going towards the extremes you know whenever they get certain cues and again and again brought back so that samatvam yoga uchchate kind of a concept goes in dbt but these are very specialized uh, courses and require a specialized training <laughs> to deliver them yeah we came across these words in the material you had given sir so i had a confusion how to understand these and compare with the eastern philosophy sir so, uh, they work mainly at the level of thinking process only they go don't go deeper than that yes vaibhav okay sir i wanted to ask like to uh, to what depth is eastern uh, uh eastern uh, psychotherapy is practiced in the months and uh, comparatively like which is giving better results compared to like eastern uh, uh, eastern the psychotherapy or western psychotherapy yes. or the mixture of both so comparing that actually um, in 2017 uh, dalai lama dalai lama came to nimhans and we uh, uh, had a opportunity to uh, attend his uh, lecture and then at the end of it uh, there were some question and answer sessions so there i still remember uh, the a professor of clinical psychology from nimhans asked question to his holiness dalai lama see where do you see western psychotherapy Uh, psychotherapy as compared to the eastern psychotherapy or the understanding of the mind according to eastern and the western concepts so uh, smilingly you know dalai lama said that western psychotherapy is still in kindergarten hmm, as compared to the eastern approaches but the problem for us you know he says that people who are from tibet the problem is that we consider india as our guru and we look towards our guru and our guru is looking towards the west so we get confused hmm so this was his question that you know he asked us to look into our own systems into our own strength hmm so uh, when we you know are applying these concepts in the department of integrative medicine um i uh, can say that the department of clinical psychology is also doing lot of wonderful work especially in relieving the symptoms that the pe- that are bothering the people it is like modern medicine giving them painkillers so in that sense modern psychotherapy is required it is very useful whereas 
when it comes to changing the lifestyle of the person and preventing the problem from coming back into his life and enhancing his resilience in the long term, there that Eastern psychotherapy plays a very, very important role. Of course, you know, in this approach, with these approaches, we have been able to resolve acute conflicts also. For example, one case which I remember is one of the uh, faculty who came to here came to Nimhans as a Ramalinga Swami fellow from US. Now this lady came with her husband husband from US for a neuroimaging project, and then what we observed was that um, uh, she when she came she was pregnant, and uh, uh, no she had delivered a baby. The baby was one month old, and with the one month old baby this lady came to India. She got into Nimhans. And they got into some apartment. And the, within two days, you know, their baby got very ill. And then they were running in the government setup here, trying to manage the baby. And they could not save the baby. The baby died. Hmm? And this lady went into great depression and uh, remorse, bereavement. And in that scenario, she was taken to... Uh, CBT, you know, and it was, she was not in a, at all in a position even to undergo CBT. It didn't work. Uh, she met uh, our Dr. Venkat, who is a renowned psychiatrist here. He referred the patient to me. Hmm? Then I met him, uh, her and her, her husband together and listened to them very patiently. It was really, really very sad story, you know, such baby, you know, uh, died because of some meningitis and all. So then, I, rather than going into the Western psychotherapy mod models, I described them an instance that is described in the, in the autobiography of a yogi, where uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, you know, was very much attached to a deer. And uh, that deer, you know, he used to feed take care of it, love it very much and it grew for around one and a half, two years and after that the, the deer fell ill and became very weak. It couldn't even walk and every day, you know, Paramahamsa Yogananda would pray to God, would pray that the deer should get well. One night in the dream of Paramahamsa Yogananda, the deer came. Hmm? And dear prayed to Paramahamsa Yogananda that already a more exciting new life, my evolution is waiting for me. I pray to you, please let me go. Hmm? And with that, uh, from next day he accepted it and the dear died. Hmm? So in that sense, I tried to explain to them that Bhagavad Gita says that what has gone is only the body. The Atman that is there is still there. Your daughter is still there. Your daughter is still watching you. She is there in one dimension, one plane where you cannot see her. And I definitely believe that your daughter would like to come back to you because she loved you very much. You loved to her very much. So why are you become, why are you hopeless? Has life ended here? Life doesn't end according to the Yoga Shastras, life is unending. It is continuing. We are all ancient people. There have been many more lives previously where your daughter had many different kind of relationships with you. Now she had this kind of a Runanu Bandha, Karma Bandhana with you, which is now finished. She will come back. Why are you worried? Then I asked her which God or deity that she is devoted to. She was devoted to Devi. Then I asked her, you go and make a wholehearted prayer to Devi. You know? So she went to Coimbatore. There... Uh, uh, she did some rituals you know, for her peace, for her baby in uh, the Devi temple there. Came back and literally, you know, I can tell you, it, the discussion that happened was uh, one year ago. Same lady now is nine months pregnant mm -hmm. and uh, she is still in campus. I met her two days back and she still, you know, uh, thanks me for that one session for that one session where she could get that solace and direction in her life and uh, could again, you know, plan a baby 
and she says that i am 100% sure that it is going to be a baby girl and what his name is uh, her daughter the, the, the daughter is back so i told her even if it is a boy it is not necessary that soul has to take the same gender it can take any gender but the same soul has come now what what has happened i i am not aware of the transcendental dimensions what happened but whatever i spoke to her it gave her energy it actually removed the block in the flow of her life and she once again you know started moving towards the life her husband is now satisfied and that pain of losing that baby is completely gone completely gone hmm? so so therefore i am saying that we can you know uh, see some tremendous results happening in a single session of eastern psychotherapy also and uh, in that way in the western uh, uh, psychotherapy uh, models uh, for acute crisis also there are certain situation so these are certain examples based on our clinical experiences that i wanted to share with all of you thank you thank you let me just stop the recording dr himan yes yes madam yeah this is uh, this is one last question which i wanted to ask you regarding your module so i for example i'm born with a trait where i am uh, uh, more in favor of uh, raja yoga okay. i have a problem i come to you so do you go with uh, fortifying the same trait or do you actually fortify my dormant uh, uh, part of it which is like say bhakti i'm not a very emotional communicating person so do you go ahead and make what i am more in, i mean born with more powerful or fortify and make the use of the dormant part and elevate it like what bhagavad gita says yes very beautiful huh? so dr meena has asked me a question that her natural way of coping would go with practice where she would go with the path of raj yog she is also asking like in bhagavad gita it appears that arjuna is a kshatriya he should also be following a path of raj yoga but ultimately he goes into bhakti he surrenders everything karishye vachanam tava whatever you say i will do so she says will you take out my dormant aspect or will you use my strength only so what i want to tell here is that arjuna was always a bhakta hmm? it was that he, it was not coming to his own awareness he he thought that he is a raj yogi in that way if it is so then your bhakti aspect as we interview as we talk to each other if that domain slowly comes up then i will strengthen that hmm? so whereas i have seen you know that people it is not necessary that people who are very muscular or very you know uh, oriented to body or those aspects that they cannot be a bhakta so rather than calling it dormant we can call that there are certain aspects that we are only not aware of which are very much there as karma samskaras that we have been doing in our past lives so therefore an art of psychotherapy here is to understand that in a person and in the beginning you know these four paths appear very different they are like you are climbing a mountain hmm? so you can climb the mountain from four directions but as you go more and more up all these four paths start coming closer and closer to each other you know so in the beginning you may have a distinct path where okay if it appears that you are a raj yoga kind of a person then in the beginning i would begin by actually asking you to perform certain set of asanas then pranayama fast pranayama slow pranayama then yoga nidra deep relaxation and then at the end you know when your mind is completely out of this clutter then make a whole hearted prayer you know? so in that way we will begin by performing uh, or going with your strengths and see whether you you progress through that and slowly as you go deeper and deeper into the path of raj yoga it may be possible that as your chitta gets purified your your dormant bhakti which is very much there it actually comes forth and you then start moving more as a bhakta but in the beginning it's itself if i teach you bhakti it won't come hmm? it won't work that go so therefore uh, this is uh, something that we have to decide from case to case basis ma'am thank you thank you so much i will stop the recording